The rates of violent crime in the United States has been virtually unchanged since 1970, but the percentage of Americans incarcerated for crime has skyrocketed, with the United States now leading the world in the percentage of our people behind bars. What are the best alternatives to incarceration? How can the United States reform its criminal justice system in ways which benefit the full diversity of our people and embody the broadest definition? definition of public safety. This episode of The Whole Truth was made possible by Amatech, CNX, UGI Amerigas, SEI, Buchanan Ingersoll Rooney, and by For hundreds of years in English-speaking courtrooms around the world, people have sworn an oath to tell not only the truth, but rather the whole truth. The oath reflects the wisdom that failing to tell all of a story can be as effective as lying if your goal is to make the facts support your point of view. In the courtroom, the search for truth also relies on advocates advancing firm, contradictory arguments and doing so with decorum. All of these apply to the court of public opinion, what John Stuart Mill called the marketplace of ideas. This series is a place in which the competing voices on the most important issues of our time are challenged and set into meaningful context so that viewers like you can decide for themselves the whole truth. Once, especially during the surge in crime during the crack epidemic of the 1980s and 1990s, there was a strong bipartisan consensus for what people called tough punishment policies. Today, there is a growing bipartisan consensus that the high rates of incarceration resulting from these earlier policies is not the reason for reductions we've seen in crime, but has actually worsened social and economic conditions for millions. To consider these issues, the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia gathered a panel of thought leaders in an historic venue, Philadelphia's Eastern State Penitentiary, the world's first modern prison and its most copied. This discussion was led by the Whole Truth executive producer, Craig Snyder, president of the World Affairs Council. Thank you, David. Uh, joining us uh, for this discussion at the historic Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia are Mr. Robert Lissenby, uh, first assistant district attorney of Philadelphia, Mr. Paul Butler, the Albert Brick Professor in Law at Georgetown University School of Law. Mr. Jeffrey Brown, President and CEO of Brown Superstores and the founder of Uplift Solutions. And Mr. Mark Holden, Senior Vice President and General Counsel of Coke Industries. Uh, kind of frame for us your view of this topic, how best to reform <clears throat> American criminal justice beyond mass incarceration. Uh, I was a prosecutor. I represented the government in criminal court in the District of Columbia, and I used that power to put black men in prison, and black women, Latino people, poor people, like a lot of prosecutors, that was pretty much all I did. During the time that I did that work, I learned some things that changed the ways that I felt about my responsibilities as an American, as an African American, and as a person who wants to make a difference in this world. Uh, one of the concerns I had was about race. If you go to a criminal court in the District of Columbia and Philadelphia and New York, you would think that white people don't commit crime. They're a percentage of the city, but they're not present in the criminal court in the way that black and brown people are. And I understood that that was a problem. And when I looked at some of the data, that there are more African American people now under the criminal justice under criminal justice supervision than there were slaves in 1850. Uh, that if you're a black man who didn't graduate from high school, you're in your 40s, you're more likely to be incarcerated than you are to have a job. Uh, one million souls, one million African American people are in prison. And so when I think about what needs to be done, I think reform is not ambitious enough. I think we should think about transformation. If we think about the, the great struggles for racial justice in our country, they've all been struggles about abolition. 
abolition of slavery, abolition of the old Jim Crow. Now is the time to imagine abolition of the new Jim Crow. So our journey um, in the criminal justice reform really started with a different objective. Um, Fifteen years ago, I'm a fourth generation grocer by the way, and um, 15 years ago uh, the state was looking at uh, the access to healthy and affordable food versus your life expectancy. And there's uh, over 100 studies to suggest that even a mile or two apart, um, pr uh, primarily uh, people of color that are low income will live 15 to 20 years less than, than my kids will live. And the, the evidence was presented to me that if only we could get everybody access to fresh, affordable food, we could substantially narrow the life expectancy. So I started out with that objective in mind, and we started opening big, beautiful, full-service supermarkets in, in uh, underprivileged neighborhoods. And we weren't sure exactly how to do it, and so we started out with town hall meetings. And we'd have town hall meetings as a CEO, I would lead the meeting and people would tell me what their problems were, the kind of experiences they had with business, with government and other institutions that have failed them. And they'd give me a list of uh, homework. And along the way, as we were opening these stores, one of my customers and community leaders gave me a really good education on the criminal justice system from her perspective and helped me to understand why it should matter to me. Um, not that it didn't matter to me before, but I don't think I was informed as much as I should considering the work that I did. And what she said was that, God bless you, you're opening stores, no one else will. We really appreciate that. But, you know, we're never going to be the greatest customers because so many of us have been incarcerated. And once you've been incarcerated, no one will hire you. So you're basically serving people that all, always are going to live on government and entitlements, or a lot of the population will. And we're worried you won't make it. And so we're not sure who to go to, but we think you should fix this problem. <laughs> and of course, uh, I have to admit that a number of my executives were a little concerned about the fact that I probably would want to. And uh, we were thinking about um, how to approach that. And we figured jump in head first. That's the only way to do it. And we went and hired a half a dozen returning citizens in the next store we were about to open 15 years ago. And uh, to our surprise, we loved the, the uh, half a dozen people we hired. And some of them went on relatively quickly to be management, uh, making 50, 60, or 70,000 a year with very good performance. And very few were a problem. So we hired another dozen. And what we've discovered is in almost every way, uh, our returning citizen students have outperformed the general population in almost everything a business would be concerned about whether it's um, retention rates, work performance, uh, months to promotion, ultimate career attainment, uh, outperforming. And uh, it doesn't really sound logical that that would be true at first, except for you're dealing with a population that has experienced real suffering, real trauma, and it's been incarcerated, doesn't want to go back to jail. And to begin with, they probably went to jail because they were more ambitious than average, but didn't have an opportunity to do it the right way. And so I think you know, what we've learned is this is a, a massive number of people that were written off that are misunderstood. I agree with Paul. We need to fundamentally transform what we're doing. Um, nipping around the edges hasn't worked, won't work, and there's so much that needs to happen. And it's not just in our criminal justice system, and it's in all parts of our society. And it really starts with community, so it's great to see a community here today, because that is ultimately what will get us, where, get us where we need to go. So a little bit about me, I'm, I'm with Koch Industries. We're, I've been very fortunate to work there for 23 years. Charles Koch and David Koch. We've hired people with criminal records since I've been with the company, so going on 23 years. Um, and we continue to do it to this day. We do it because it's the right thing to do, but we do it because it gives us a competitive advantage, we really feel. Now you look at our current criminal justice system, the way it's set up, and it's the ultimate failed big government program, picks winners and losers, it's a pay to play system. If you're rich and guilty, as Brian Stevenson says, you're gonna be okay. It treats them better than the poor and the innocent. So when you look at the number of people in our country with a criminal record, it's some estimates are one in three. 
So that's one in three people have a criminal record, which is as many if not more people with a criminal record than have a college degree in this country. So from a perspective of uh, an employer, a global employer like us with 120,000 employees around the world, if we were to say, you know what, we're not gonna look at one third of the applicant pool, that's really stupid. Um, so this is all about, from our perspective, um, removing barriers to opportunity, eliminating injustices, equal justice, giving second chances to people, and mutual benefit. Okay. Um, Bob, I want to start. I want to start with you. Um, what do you think is wrong? What's mistaken in the narrative that says the tough on crime uh, approach, including uh, increased incarceration of, of nonviolent offenders, that it worked? Uh, and that it has given, particularly in the center of our cities where people want to live, work, and play, um, uh, an atmosphere of greater security. What's wrong with that argument? Well, I, I guess I would say that, uh, you know, in looking at the argument, there's, there are a lot of assumptions made. Uh, there's an assumption that uh, the people who were arrested and placed in jail uh, were people who were likely to reoffend. Um, you know, the statistics don't show that. Uh, a lot of people who were placed in jail were low-risk offenders. Or, like, or low risk at reoffending. Uh, they were placed in jail for long periods of time. Studies show that if you place people in jail for longer periods of time than quote unquote necessary, you're a little more likely to cause them to enter a life of crime and stay in a life of crime than you are if you put them in for shorter periods of time. We know that if they're there for shorter periods of time, they're more likely to stay in contact with their families, their communities, more likely to stay in contact with opportunities for education, jobs, and that kind of thing. Putting away for long periods of time, put them in a culture of crime, and, and often it just doesn't, doesn't turn out to be the best kind of thing. We know also that there's been poor uh, um, uh, uh, examples involving young people. We put large numbers of young people in jail. The arrests were twice as high uh, back in the 90s as they are now. Uh, the crime wave among young people ended back in 1994, and crime has been going down since 94, but the rest kept going up for another 10 years. So we kind of missed the curve. We're not using a scientific basis for deciding which people to put away, deciding how long to put them away, deciding what we're going to do when they come back, and making sure that they have the kind of resources to reenter the community and be successful. Until we do that, we're really just causing greater problems for our society than, uh, um, than we need to. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, let me turn to your... Uh, your comment that your job as a prosecutor was very largely putting men of color uh, in prison. Uh, why are uh, black men, about 6% of the population, almost 50% uh, of the prison population? Uh, let's understand it's not because they're black. Black people do not commit crime uh, because of the color of their skin. So if we think about what makes people at risk for committing the kinds of violent crime that drive prison admissions. Uh, two things, uh, living in a high poverty, segregated neighborhood, seven out of eight of the people who live in those neighborhoods are black or brown, plus guns, easy access to guns. You add those two things, that's a recipe for people being at risk for being victims of crime and for being perpetrators of crime. So we could think about the, the failed war on drugs. There you have an obvious case for selective prosecution. That's discrimination, right? So I'm a university professor. Uh, it doesn't surprise me to know that black folks don't use drugs more than anybody else. Uh, if in DC I go to the National Institute of Health, how many people use drugs? They say 13% of people who use drugs are black. About 13% of our population is also African American. What about sellers? Well, most people who buy drugs, it's kind of a segregated transaction. Most people who buy drugs say they buy them from someone at their own risk. If you go, again, in D.C., if I go from the National Institute of Health, jump on the red line, go to the Justice Department, who's locked up for drug crime? 60% are black. 13% of people who do the crime, 60% of people who do the time. I guess the last thing I'll say is, what if? What if rather than spending that money to put people in cages, you spend it on health care, on education, on job training? Not for lawyers. I don't have a hard time in DC finding a lawyer. I can't find a plumber. <laughs> if we can get people to do that work, uh, that keeps people out of prison. Thank you.
Um, so the, the, first, the first question is about really the politics of making the kind of transformation that, uh, that you all uh, are in consensus is needed. Um, Richard Nixon, 1968, Donald Trump, 2016, both campaigned literally using the same language in which they said the most basic civil right uh, is the, the right to feel safe, uh, to be safe in your home, um, on the street, to be safe in your person and in your property. That is the fundamental civil right. The precondition for the exercise of any other civil right is safety. And correlated, the primary responsibility of government, number one responsibility of government, is to protect that right to feel and to be safe. Both of them won those elections. So there is uh, clearly still a law and order, literally those terms, law and order constituency in the United States that is large. How can the things that you all agree uh, should be done get done? I'm going to start with you, Mark, and we'll go around. Because it's worked in the states, you said earlier. And um, so, I mean, I'm, I think everybody here is okay with law and order. I mean, we want an orderly society. We want the rule of law. It's just a matter of what laws are we talking about and, and how are they enforced and what is the punishment and what are the repercussions after that. So from my perspective, I'd say that what we've seen, again, in the states, and it's going up to 30 states or so almost that have done criminal justice reform, they've changed that. And, and really, at the end of the day, it isn't about tough on crime or soft on crime. I'm repeating myself. It's about being smart on crime and soft on taxpayers based on data-driven and evidence-based practices. And yeah, we're going to have people in our society who break the law that need to be incarcerated. But that doesn't mean we should be giving them a life sentence either in real time for a nonviolent offense like that we do, particularly at the federal level around drugs, which is crazy, um, or the, the basically the virtual life sentence because you can't get a job, you can't get housing, you can't do anything. And what we need to do is have a redemptive system. And you know, and the hope would be that we'd have a lot fewer people coming to prison if we put more money into our schools and into other programs to keep people out to begin with. But once they're in prison, we need to make that investment as well, not just warehousing people and locking them up. So I think that the, I think people are wise enough to that. Thank you. Jeff. So from my perspective, uh, change requires leadership. And what you noticed in our party system, if you fall under a certain party, you tend to believe in all the exact same things, which seems like almost inhuman that you would believe in exactly the same things. And so I think it does take leadership. And I don't think that leadership comes from elected officials. I think it comes from people on this panel and other leaders in society who push them, who push back at them. So that's the first thing. The second thing um, that Mark talked about is data. And most things we do successfully have some scientific element, have a data element. And uh, I, I'm, I'm convinced that the data very clearly shows that our system of mass incarceration, long sentences, makes us less safe because when people leave, they can't come back to society ever. So they can never get their record cleared. No one will hire them. It's almost a recipe for almost 100% chance of reincarceration. So the current system we have now uh, is really making us less safe. And I think it takes leadership to explain to people that you won't be safe until people that have no opportunity have an opportunity. And if they have an opportunity and they could prosper, they're going to be like everyone else and they're not going to do things that are going to hurt you. And right now, the system we have is maximizing people that, that are hopeless and that have a high probability of committing a crime because we've left them no other choice. So in the introduction, what we heard was true. This is kind of like what prisons look like. The only thing is you can't, you can't hear. You can't hear what they sound like. 80% of people who are locked up are either mentally ill or addicts. You could say that prisons are the largest provider of, of mental health services, except they don't actually provide those services, most of them. So imagine those cells. You can't smell it. When I was a prosecutor and I used to go to a prison to interview a, a witness, first thing I would do when I left was go home and take a shower. 
Prisons stink. Prisons are, um, are miserable places. So abolition does not mean opening the door to every prison tomorrow and letting everybody go home. Think about it as a process of gradual decarceration uh, with the eye of always keeping us safe but locking up as few people as possible. It's not a new idea. It's been around since prisons have been created. Charles Dickens was an abolitionist after he visited places like this. So what is it that we hope prison does? Uh, we hope that it keeps us safe from people who would hurt us if they weren't locked up. And when people have caused harm, when they've done bad, we hope it makes them accountable for what they've done. Those of us who've worked in the system know that prison doesn't do either of those very well. And so then the question is, how can we use our American ingenuity to think of ways to do it better? And what this place is about, where we are now, it's kind of about our optimism, right? Because before this place existed, the way that we punished people who did bad was we killed them, or we hurt their bodies, or we banished them. We made them leave the community and never come back. So this was an experiment. Experiment is 200 years old. We now know it hasn't worked really well. So now it's time to think about the next thing. And the wonderful news there is there are communities all over the country working on that problem. Common Justice is a community organization based in Brooklyn. Uh, they have a deal with the DA there. Uh, when people, it's usually guys, have caused harm, if the victim agrees, case comes out of the criminal legal process and goes to this community organization, restorative justice. And there, the man who's caused the harm, he's got to make it up to the victim in a way that she feels that she's being respected. She can never be made whole again. But he's got to do the best he can, and he's got to take steps in his mind, with his body, to make sure he's not going to hurt anybody else. You're right, it is about evidence not about emotion. The data suggests that this program works way better than prison. It's hard work, therapy, sitting down, dealing with your stuff. Sometimes guys in the middle of it, they say, man, I wish I'd gone to prison, because this is too hard. But it works way better. That's American ingenuity. Uh, that's the vision. Uh, 50 years from now, we're not going to be putting people in cages because we're going to know it didn't work. Uh, so the quest is to, to get to that day. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, we don't have to look far into the future to see uh, reform and transformation that's actually working. Um, I think we need to, to stop for a moment and look at, at our, on our juvenile justice side. Um, I spent four years in Washington working for the president on, for the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. And there I was able to see that this, uh, this artificial red state, blue state divide uh, really blinds us sometimes to progress being made uh, throughout the nation. You have states like Georgia, uh, Kentucky, Virginia transform their juvenile justice systems where they've cut the number of children being arrested in half, the number of kids going to placement by more than half, uh, costs there some plant times running two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars per year per child for secure confinement have been eliminated. New York closed down 24 of its juvenile justice facilities in the state uh, and lay, leaving about 10 there and brought their kids back to the city of New York where they now keep them in, in placement facilities close to home. So we've seen not just reform but fundamental transformation in that system dramatically reducing the cost, reducing uh, um, the number of kids in placement and getting much, much better outcomes. We've also seen a lot of this on the adult side. Uh, and I think that we need to be sure to take a close look at examples in our own nation that are working where evidence-based practices, evidence-based practices that have been carefully examined and studied by lots and lots of experts have shown us the way. We just have to be careful and read up on these things, look at what's working, adopt some of those practices that are, practices that are working right here in our own city, and we'll find that we can bring about the change that is just waiting on our doorsteps to bring about. 
So I don't think it's far off. I don't think it's the next generation. I don't think that I have to wait to, to, for my sons and daughters to see this. I want to see it right now. The reason I'm involved right now is because I want to see it during my lifetime uh, come to fruition. So those are some thoughts. We have a sense of urgency, a sense of, of, of really feeling like every day is a day that we need to invest every ounce of energy we can into this process, and that's what we're doing. So. Gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for being with us on The Whole Truth. Uh, Wonderful uh, discussion, and uh, we appreciate all your insights. As always, we leave it to you at home to decide for yourself the whole truth. I'm David Eisenhower. Thank you for watching. This episode of The Whole Truth was made possible by Amatec, CNX, UGI Amerigas, SEI, Buchanan Ingersoll Rooney, and by 